Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Corn Board and the Nebraska Soybean Board. No matter how you look at it, animal agriculture helps Nebraska's economy. The livestock industry provides increased tax revenues for schools and community services. Livestock enterprises also create jobs while contributing to existing businesses such as local banks and grocery stores. A thriving livestock industry helps maintain our current way of life, but also provides opportunities for the next generation of farm families. The Nebraska Soybean Checkoff helps to raise awareness of the importance of animal agriculture to Nebraska. Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board and the Nebraska Corn Board. Welcome to this week's edition of Market Journal. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. We're reporting this week from the 2015 International Food and Agribusiness Management Association World Conference in St. Paul, Minnesota. This year's forum is aimed at food security issues to 2050. You'll hear more on that topic later. On this episode, Ed Us, it looks at corn and soybean markets. Eric Thor explains why the Trans-Pacific Partnership is a big deal to U.S. farmers. Bethany Hahn describes the impact of avian influenza here in the nation's top turkey producing state. And Ken Zuckerberg describes the role of big data in agriculture. University of Minnesota Extension Grain Marketing Specialist Ed Usset is our market analyst this week. The latest USDA crop progress report shows nearly all of the nation's corn, 97%, is emerged, along with three-fourths of the country's soybean crop. Condition ratings for both are holding fairly steady, but they're not quite as good as they were at this time a year ago. We talked with Ed here Thursday morning to get his thoughts on corn and soybean markets, but started by asking about the shape of the crop in Minnesota. Uh, very good. Uh, we've had an awful lot of rain. Uh, uh, I, I look at my own home, which uh, I know that isn't the crop, it's just grass, but I, I can't mow it enough. I mow it every five days. It looks wonderful and, un and uh, fortunately or unfortunately, maybe how you view it, I think a whole lot of Minnesota looks that way. We talked in December at the Soybean Expo in Wahoo about setting a marketing strategy for the upcoming year. Tell me what your strategy was, the price levels you set, and whether or not they hit. Well, I started uh, almost a year ago, 10 months ago. I usually think about starting at production costs, which would be a cash price, 420, 430, 440 in Nebraska, southern Minnesota. And that, of course, would be December futures at about uh, 480 a bushel, five dollars. Well, that's that just hasn't happened, and uh, I quickly retraced that this spring. Uh, back by late winter, I should say, early spring, I'd reset my thoughts. Uh, get me something around four and a half dollars in December corn, 440. I'm gonna bite the bullet and get something done because things could get worse. Well, I haven't gotten anything done, Jeff. Uh, uh, we're now at 375 in the futures. That's a 330 cash price to many of you good corn huskers. By the way, I wore my colors just for, for your audience. Boy, we appreciate yes, that. We I really know. do. I know. Uh, but you look at 330 cash corn, that's, that's a dollar and a quarter under production costs. And I can't chase that. I can't chase that. I have to hope for something better in the months ahead. Meaning what, you just keep waiting? I'll just keep waiting on pre-harvest pricing. I will not chase it lower at this point. Uh, I can regret not biting the bullet maybe uh, 40 cents ago, 50 cents ago. But, um, you know, hind hindsight, that's hindsight. I didn't do it, chose not to, chose to wait for something better. And now I'm not gonna just chase it lower. Was the same, uh, the same situation applicable in soybeans? Yeah. Uh, we've got, uh, uh, I think, a starting point, a break-even starting point on November soybeans would be at least ten and a half to eleven dollars a bushel. Well, we're at uh, nine dollars and forty cents today in soybeans. We're we're a dollar and a half below break-even prices. 
Uh, can we go lower? Unfortunately, yes. Uh, will I chase it? Will I get aggressive now chasing it lower? No, I won't. I'm, go I'm gonna tough it out to new crop and uh, and if nothing happens, I'll have to figure it out after harvest. Have you had to do this before in terms of have you set targets before and they haven't filled before? Oh, absolutely. Uh, um, absolutely. This happens. We haven't seen it in a long time. I call uh, the period 2007 to 2014 the second golden age of American agriculture. Well, this is uh, middle of 2015. I think we put that behind us. And uh, I would take our listeners back to early 2000s, late 90s, periods when we had extended times below production costs. It can happen. And we don't like it, but it can happen. How bearish are the indicators that the market is showing you right now? Well, it's all about weather right now. It's all about weather and rain. And uh, it, uh, I, we want to talk about flooding the crop out. And there is some of that. There's some delayed planning. Uh, there are issues out there. But for every acre, there's an issue. We've got 10 acres who've got a, that have ample rain, are in, in the, and they're in a great position to take on the July heat and those key development times. For farmers, Ed, in Nebraska and Minnesota who are still holding that grain, waiting for the right price, what should be the strategy? Well, that, that's a trickier problem because uh, you know, I've taken care of old crop issues. My, my old crop corn and beans on my mythical farms, those sales have been made. And so I feel I can be afford to be a little more stubborn about new crop. Uh, if you've got two crops running on this, last year's crop and this year's, you've, you've really boxed yourself into a corner. Not only that, we're coming upon the end of June and I have something I call the 11th commandment of grain marketing. That is, you shouldn't be holding cash grain in the bin after July 1. Uh, the, the idea there, and I, I, I explain it well in the, the second edition of my book coming out soon, I explain uh, the 11th commandment of grain marketing where you've got not only a tendency for futures prices to go lower in the summer to fall, but you've also got basis, which starts its defensive move slowly from summer highs to harvest lows. The odds of making money on grain in the bin, you're, you, it gets really tough for old crop grain. People are going to have to bite the bullet here and get something sold. Next week, Mike Briggs will join us to look at cattle markets. During our coverage from Japan, you learned how the Trans-Pacific Partnership, or TPP, could impact trade between countries such as Japan and the U.S. For example, we told you how Australian beef holds a larger market share in Japan, but does so thanks in part to lower tariffs than beef from America. We've also talked in the past about Trade Promotion Authority, or TPA, a measure that would allow Congress to vote for or against trade agreements at the end of the president's negotiations. The efforts of Congress to pass TPA have failed so far, although a renewed push in Washington has been in the news this week. At Arizona State University, Eric Thor works with global finance and trade. He also has family farming ties in eastern Nebraska. We spoke with him at this week's conference to ask why the Trans-Pacific Partnership is so important across the U.S. and in Nebraska. It's a very important step to essentially level the playing field. Let's remember Canada, Australia already have agreements with this part of the world that basically give them a leg up. And what this will help do is increase the revenue opportunities for all of us farmers from Nebraska and at the same time uh, allow us to basically step forward in terms of participating in uh, the APEC uh, expansion of the markets in some 47 countries in the, in the Asian Pacific area. Tell me why these things are so complicated and so difficult to get through. I don't think there's a good answer on that, <laughs> other than they're written by lawyers in Washington, D.C. <laughs> but the, the bottom line to all of those, and I helped write the Farm Bill in the 1990s, they are becoming increasingly complex. We have some 400 different commodities, and now the value-added crops and the banking and the trade uh, food safety implications are just critical. And uh, we, we want to make sure they're all inclusive. And of course, that means they're going to be expanded. And uh, at the same time, as we look forward, other countries are developing those. 
There's some 160 different countries now in WTO, and many of them already have in place the kind of trade agreements that this administration would like, and it would help use and pay for the infrastructure we need to compete out to 2050, which is what the purpose of this Congress is here in Minneapolis. Over the last few weeks, we've not only heard about the TPP, but also the TPA, Trade Promotion Authority. Why is something like that so critical to TPP and free trade? Well, as you've seen in different ports, like the Port of Long Beach, the Port of LA, uh, et cetera, what that's allowed us to do is to essentially borrow and put in the infrastructure needed for the two maxi ships. And I don't know if you've ever seen the new maxi grain ships that can basically go between the U.S. and Japan in 11 days. But the bottom line is they're phenomenal, but they require much better and bigger infrastructure. Because we not only need to, to sail the ships, we need to load them. And you want to be able to load a ship like that in 24 hours. How does that relate to TPA, Trade Promotion Authority? Because it allows you to create a f funding mechanism uh, that the bankers and the world capital markets will accept. And at the same time, we have uh, a real challenging railroad and barge system that serves Nebraska. You know, most of our corn goes down the Mississippi to the Mississippi ports, but you can't do it unless you have the right barges and the right railroad cars today. Is there a specific industry that's really looking forward to the TPP? Corn, soybeans, wheat, beef, pork? Well, I think in particular the grains are one that are important. For example, we just had uh, two weeks ago a group from China here trying to buy feed for the dairy industry. They want to triple their dairy industry, but they don't have the feed. And you know, the one thing Nebraska has done very well is help feed uh, essentially the world, both humans and animals, when we forget that. And let's remember, there are more animals in Asia than there are people. So they may have three billion people, but the estimates are they have between five and six billion animals to feed and we can be a principal part of that. How soon would farmers and ranchers see the effects of TPP? I think it's possible to see it in 2016. Uh, you know, the marketing cycle for this year is pretty well locked in, but as you look ahead a year, people are already anticipating where are they gonna get grain? And then, let's remember, Australia is going through its climate change drought, and the Canadians themselves the, the Vancouver and the West Coast properties are pretty much full and they're locked in on the railroad. So this could be a big opportunity, I think, for Nebraska to increase the revenue for the farmers. To learn more about the Trans-Pacific Partnership, you can visit the MJ Extras tab on our website and view our reporting from Japan on the potential agreement. The USDA this week released preliminary results detailing the spread of avian influenza in the United States. The agency's Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service believes wild birds first introduced the virus to commercial poultry. Further, in addition to instances of less than ideal biosecurity measures, it's also found evidence to support the idea the virus can spread through air. Avian influenza has affected more than 48 million birds across the United States and has taken a toll here in the nation's top turkey producing state of Minnesota. While Iowa has lost the most birds due to avian influenza, Minnesota has reported more detections than any other state in the country. The Minnesota Board of Animal Health is leading the response efforts here. To learn more about how the state has responded to the virus, we talked with Bethany Hahn from that department here in St. Paul Monday afternoon. In total, in Minnesota so far, 108 farms have been affected by highly pathogenic avian influenza. It, that's in 23 counties. The distribution has been across the state, unfortunately. Our response in Minnesota has been a swift one. We are following USDA's guidelines for how we do respond to this disease. It includes surveillance testing, euthanasia of affected flocks, and then of course working alongside the producer through the entire process, which includes getting them to the point where they can restock their barns with birds. What's the timing of the affected cases been in terms of how long has it been since you've uh, confirmed a positive? It seems like it's really been snowballing up here. Yeah, we confirmed our first case in Minnesota on March 5th, and then we had a period of about two, two and a half weeks where we didn't have additional cases and we were really hopeful that that would be all. But as we now know, that's not the case. We have had all of the farms since then, since probably the end of March, we've been identifying additional flocks. And you're right, I would say probably 
mid-April, we probably peaked out with our number of cases. Now, it's been 10 or 11 days in Minnesota since we have had another case, so we're very hopeful that that trend continues. Can you tell me about the depopulation efforts, uh, sure. disposal as well? Sure. Most of our infected flocks in Minnesota have been turkey flocks. Minnesota's number one in turkey production, so it's not super surprising that, that we would have more turkey flocks affected. And the, um, the, the depopulation of these flocks is important because what it does is it helps us to control additional spread of the virus. It's important that that's done quickly. And so we have euthanized over 9 million birds in Minnesota, euthanized or have died from the virus. Um, and again, that's a preventative measure. It's also more humane than allowing birds to die from the virus. Um, in terms of carcass disposal, we have been able to, most of our producers have done in-house composting, meaning the, the composted birds are, um, hap it happens inside the barns. And um, you know, all things considered, that process has gone fairly well, considering it's a large scale event and we've been able to do it pretty quickly, all things considered. Have you begun repopulating any, any of the flocks? Yes, I'm happy to say that yes, we have. And that was a recent development. Last week or the week before, my memory is I'm, mm -hmm. it's, it's escaping me right <laughs> now, but I, our first farm repopulated not too long ago, and then we had another farm repopulate last week. So we do expect that trend to continue as well, as a lot of the farms are now getting through the composting process and then cleaning and disinfection, and then after that, they would have the ability to restock. So we, just like the number of cases kind of increased for a while, now we're in the recovery mode, and we do expect many of those farms to start turning over really quickly now, getting back to business. What's the outlook for the rest of the summer? I wish I could tell you for sure, but what the experts tell us is that if this virus acts like other viruses, viruses don't like sunny, hot weather. And in Minnesota, we're finally at that point where the weather is pretty decent. It's one of the few months that we have really decent weather in Minnesota. So as, as the weather continues to warm and hopefully it stays that way longer, we do anticipate that the number of cases will decrease and, and maybe go away at least, for, at least for a few months. We're very hopeful of that. The latest numbers from the Nebraska Department of Agriculture show avian influenza has impacted five Nebraska farms with an additional flock remaining under quarantine in Knox County. The June Nebraska Farmer updates readers on extreme weather events that impacted Nebraska in May and June of 2014. Tornadoes hit several Nebraska towns and a year later, residents in northeast Nebraska are still recovering from the damage. In the June issue of Nebraska Farmer, you can read about Terry and Aaron Bierman's experience rebuilding from a tornado that hit their farm on June 16th. And you can also learn some helpful tips for managing farm insurance in the event of a disaster. As we mentioned at the top of the show, we're reporting from the 2015 IFAMA conference in St. Paul, where the theme this year deals with food security to 2050. One of the focus areas of that goal is the role of big data as a major key to improving future productivity in a changing climate and with limited resources. We talked with Rabobank's Ken Zuckerberg here Tuesday to learn more about the role big data will play on the farm. Big data is one of those overused terms that means a lot of things to lots of different people. The way we think about big data is it's the plethora of information both structured and unstructured, that uh, uh, has come about because of uh, uh, information that's transmitted between people, businesses, and the internet from uh, fixed devices and mobile devices. You talked today about the situational analysis of it. Describe it to me. So what we have as respects big data and farming is that there's a lot of companies in the, uh, in the marketplace that are coming up with data intensive solutions to help farmers make more profit. Make more profit can be defined as, um, uh, you can do that by either reducing costs of inputs, such as fertilizers and chemicals, or in uh, uh, having greater yield or a combination. So that's what this, uh, uh, that's what the conversation is about right. today. And you think that there are some elements missing, am I accurate in that? That's correct. The key elements we think are missing is that while there's a lot of good products out there, there's not one comprehensive integrated solution that, will have, that essentially provides a recommendation to a farmer as to where to plant, when to plant, what to plant, and then how to, how to harvest it. Why? Why is that missing? Well, 
the companies that are at the forefront of precision agriculture connected to data, uh, those companies are inputs companies such as Monsanto and John Deere, and their systems tend to be closed. John Deere farm site has its own cloud, and Monsanto's Climate Corp is also uh, its, its own entity. They don't talk to each other. The equipment and the seed and the seed and the fertilizer are all sort of separate. And to be valuable to the farmer, one needs to really have the complete a, a picture. Is it possible to have that? I think it is. I think an outside party like an IBM or another technology firm will have to come into the uh, uh, conversation to create uh, the proper structure for success. How do you think the farmer reacts to that? So in my view, the farmer probably would, uh, would react positively to have an independent voice as part of the solution. Because? Well, uh, Monsanto sells seed and John Deere sells equipment. So while their recommendations probably are value added for the farmer, I think the farmer wants to have that independent perspective from a non-ag uh, player. How skeptical do you believe the farmer is when he or she hears the term big data? So I think they're skeptical and they're probably confused. Mm -hmm. I'm confused and I've been studying <laughs> the, the uh, uh, topic for quite a while. So I think part of the issue is perhaps redefining big data into data technology that enables better farming. Do you think privacy plays a role as we advance? Privacy has been a front and center issue. I think it's still a valid concern, but I think more of a concern from the farmers are, re relates to what are you doing with my data and are you going to then charge me uh, for recommendations that are based on the information I give you. I think that's a bigger issue than the privacy per se. To close out with, what makes the farmer adopt this technology? So I think three things. I think when the, uh, uh, an easy to understand uh, uh, product set comes together. Second, uh, uh, a, a rationality as to why they should expend the effort uh, learning and, and applying this. And then finally, a real cost benefit analysis. You're not going to pay uh, $10 per acre for something that uh, uh, doesn't yield tangible result. So it goes back to the money. We'll show you more interviews from the 2015 IFAMA conference in future episodes of Market Journal, including a look at managing costs in turbulent times with Mike Bulgy from Purdue. Now with this week's weather forecast, here's Nebraska Extension State Climatologist Al Dutcher. Well, folks, here we again for the weekly forecast. During this last week, of course, we've seen several complexes of, of precipitation move across the state. The first of the series of uh, moisture events occurred during the Sunday through Monday time frame, where we've seen thunderstorms develop across to western Nebraska, congeal and move into eastern Nebraska, and drop some very significant precipitation across the Salt River Valley and the lower Big Blue. Once again, renewing flooding as, as oh, rivers came out of their banks flooding uh, lowland areas and of course we've seen a, quite a few roads that were washed out in this region. And then we've seen a series of storms move on a daily basis from the western high plains southeastward through the western two-thirds of the state, dropping anywhere from quarter inch to an inch at a total in each singular event. Plus we didn't see the same precipitation over the same areas on a daily basis so at least we were spreading the precipitation around and then we had a fairly significant complex come through the state. Wednesday night into Thursday morning that gave us a widespread one to two inch precipitation reports across central and western Nebraska and as the system moved toward the southeast it started to fade out so precipitation totals dropped off into the half to one inch range as we got into the eastern one third of the state but most of northeastern Nebraska or at least extreme northeastern Nebraska missed out on the heavy precipitation event. Now as we go through this next seven day period there's increasing signs by the models that we're going to see some very warm temperatures building into the region um, possibly even making it to the 100 degree mark and the precipitation tendencies look like they're going to drop off significantly particularly across the southern half of the state where we will see the chances of precipitation will remain to the extreme northern part of the state as most of the complexes move through the Dakota. So let's take a look at the upper air model and see what we can expect. We have the zonal flow in place, so systems are going to move from a west to east fashion toward the Great Lakes. This is the remnants of Bill that will move off the eastern seaboard over the next 24 hours and be a non-event to 
the eastern United States. And for us, we are looking at the zonal flow continuing into tomorrow with another piece of wave moving across the Dakotas. It may clip northeastern Nebraska, but the heaviest of precipitation should remain well to our north. You'll notice this ridge starting to build in, bringing the warmer temperatures to the southern plains, and that will make it to Nebraska here on Monday as that ridge starts to expand in both to the east and to the north, so that'll bring uh, mid 90 degree temperatures into southern Nebraska with a possibility of upper 90s across southwest Nebraska. Once again, another complex of storms was across the Dakotas may ex clip extreme northern Nebraska, but it'll be very isolated in nature. As we get into Tuesday, that high pressure system builds a little bit farther north, so we're bringing mid 90 degree temperatures almost up into northern Nebraska with isolated 100 degree readings possible across south central and southwest Nebraska. On Wednesday, that ridge starts to push a little bit farther to the east. We'll be at a southwest flow, so we will still see some very warm temperatures across portions of south central southeast Nebraska with upper 90s. And we'll see this wave trying to push through the Dakotas that may push in as a little bit cooler air into the northwestern panhandle. But again, precipitation remains to the north of us. As we get into Thursday, we start to see this system sagging toward the south, increasing the precipitation probabilities across northern Nebraska. And they're also developing a complex in western Nebraska that will move through the state during the overnight hours. And as we get into Friday, that system will exit out the southeast. So we're looking at some fairly decent moisture. As we look at the temperature forecast, you can see very warm conditions with just isolated thunderstorms, mainly to the north. And then we'll see temperatures cool down toward the end of the week. Eight to 14 day forecast indicates that trough will remain in place, so we'll see cooler than normal conditions. And unfortunately, we will also see an increase in moisture as we get into next weekend. Thanks, Al. Today's interviews are available on the Market Journal website and through the Market Journal mobile app. They include information on corn and soybean markets, the importance of international trade, avian influenza in Minnesota, and the role of big data on the farm. As always, you can keep up with Market Journal during the week on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Next week, Mike Briggs will be our marketing analyst. Until then, thanks for watching. From St. Paul, I'm Jeff Wilkerson. We'll see you next week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Corn Board and the Nebraska Soybean Board. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board and the Nebraska Corn Board. When we transform Nebraska corn into ethanol, it doesn't disappear from the food supply. It just takes a little detour. Ethanol is made from the starch. The rest of the corn becomes livestock feed to create meat and dairy products, corn oil, sweetener, and other food ingredients, and maybe a little carbon dioxide to make your soft drinks fizzy. Homegrown ethanol helps satisfy America's hunger for energy and the world's appetite for feed and food. Nebraska's Family Corn Farmers, sustaining innovation.